Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another edition of Faith Matters where you are viewers. MTA set the agenda by the questions you ask. Jazakumullah and thank you for the questions you've been sending in for today's program. And we'll be covering off on quite a specific issue. But before we go to our questions, just a reminder for our viewers once again the email for your questions, thoughts, and observations. It's faithmatters at mta.tv. It's faithmatters, one word, at mta.tv. And the fax number for those of you wishing to use the fax, it's 44 for the UK, 208 687 8037. We have had questions before as to previous programs. Well, you can find these now on YouTube. If you go onto YouTube, MTA Online 1, the subject of your choice, and away you go. And I'm delighted to welcome to Faith Matters today two regular contributors. First is Azhar Hanif Sahib, all the way from the USA. He's the Naib Amir of the United States. Jamaat, welcome to Faith Matters, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Most welcome. And to his right is Ayaz Mahmood Sahib, who's a student of theology at the Amdia Institute of Languages and Theology. Ayaz, sir, welcome again That's to Faith right. Matters. Right. Gentlemen, welcome to today's program. And we're going to be quite focused today on specific issues. And it's a, a theme on the existence of God. And we've got a variety of different issues from across the world, um, some from within the community and others from beyond. And we certainly welcome viewers' questions across the board. And we're going to start, where I say from across the world, after saying that introduction, we're going to stay in London for our first one. And that comes from Maksud Ahmed Sahib from London. Jazakumullah Maksud Saab for your question. And he writes this, an atheist colleague has put forward a few arguments to prove there is no God. I would appreciate your comments on these, please. Um, the first one he asks is, we pray sincerely, and this is his fre que uh, friend or colleague putting the questions, we pray sincerely knowing that when God answers these completely heartfelt, unselfish, non-materialistic prayers, it will glorify God and help millions of people in remarkable ways. Will anything happen? No, of course not. For example, if, quotes, everyone who asks receives, end of quotes, then if we ask for cancer to be cured, it should be cured. If God gives good things to those who ask him, then if we ask him to cure cancer, he should surely cure it. Yet nothing happens. Ayar Saab, if I could start with you. This is a question which is put by many, um, not just Maksud Saab's colleague, that if God is heartfelt and he's a compassionate uh, is one of the attributes given to God. Why doesn't he hear the heartfelt plea of a cancer sufferer, for example? Well, uh, apparently a very valid question, but if we analyze the question with a bit more depth, we will see this is a really emotional question, and all of our hearts go out to such people who suffer from such diseases and difficulties. But as far as an atheist is concerned, there is no question, there is no answer, because he does not believe in God. So if there is no belief in God for an atheist, then so too God cannot be objected to. And we would accept that cancer and all of these diseases are merely a phenomenon of nature, number one. Only when we bring in God into the equation does there seem to be a purpose mm -hmm. behind everything. If suffering, uh, such as cancer and other diseases, was created as a separate entity in its own right with no purpose to serve, then most definitely this could be objectionable. But we see that there is a huge wisdom behind why there seems to be a delay in the acceptance of prayers or why diseases are not uh, cured right away. And that is the concept of trials and tribulations mm -hmm. and how these trials and tribulations mold a person spiritually, physically and mentally. And the Holy Quran has alluded to this concept where it says that God Almighty has created life and death mm -hmm. so that He may try you that amongst you which are the who are the best in their deeds. So no doubt this is necessary. Not only is suffering a is some, is not only is it a blessing in disguise, but it also molds us as people. It refines our uh, qualities mentally. We learn humility. We learn how to turn towards God. We learn to be grateful for the things which God Almighty has given mm -hmm. us. And we see that the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has mentioned something which uh, helps us understand this concept. He says that when prophets suffer from fever, mm -hmm. their pain is 
twofold. Why is this? Prophets are apparently the most beloved ones of God, but the reason they go through the most trials and tribulations and difficulties and hardships is because they are to set an example of steadfastness and patience and perseverance and persistence. Hazrat Masih Maudul the promised Messiah Islam, has mentioned uh, this concept very beautifully and I'd like to present it here. It will be very beneficial. Hazur says, why acceptance of supplications is sometimes delayed. He says that sometimes it happens that a seeker supplicates with great yearning and pain, but he observes that the result of his prayers is being postponed and delayed. What is the reason? In this connection, it is necessary to remember that there is a gradualness in the affairs of the world. How many stages has a child to pass through before becoming a full-grown person? Everything doesn't happen right away. If a couple gets married one day mm -hmm. and then they expect, they pray to God that please bless us with a child, that child will not come the next day mm -hmm. or in the next week. There's a process of nine months after that they will have mm -hmm. their prayer accepted. And Hazur says that to the degree to which a person desires to acquire high rank, that concept of spiritual development, mm -hmm. it is necessary that a person works hard and perseveres. And Azur says that perseverance and resolve are such excellent qualities that without them, a person cannot transverse the stages of success. Inna ma'al usri yusra. Verily after hardship there is ease. The Sufis and spiritual saints say something very interesting. And when I read it for the first time, I became quite caught back as well. They said that if you're not going through a state of trials and tribulations, then you should be worried because perhaps Allah the Almighty has forgotten about you mm -hmm. because without this there can be no spiritual gain and there's an example of a person who wishes to increase himself physically a person who does weightlifting to make himself stronger he puts force onto his body physically before he can become stronger so too is the case with spirituality Jazakumullah, Azhar Sahib I mean this concept obviously is in the context of an atheist and an atheist will take the view that if they don't believe in God themselves, that if there is a God and they turn to a believer, well, cancer, and let's stay with cancer, it's such a, you know, many call it incurable, and it can be one which is a very severe and painful disease as well, which grips mm -hmm. a person. Yet, why that trial? Why this trial and tribulation from a God that is merciful, a God that is compassionate towards mm -hmm. his, his own creation? Um, it's you know, and often we talk of God in terms of in in faith generally of a spiritual being that is like a father or akin to a father. Yet within that, it's why does he not look after his own creation? It, it's an, it's an excellent question because I mean I think a lot of people suffer with this. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the issue itself, much less if they have to go through some suffering, then they're really perplexed. Um, there's always this question that even why good people have to suffer so many problems, you know? Why bad things happen to good people? And this is the basis of this question, that you're saying you are good people, and yet bad things happen to you. Mm -hmm. And in the process of these bad things happening, these occurrences, illness, you know, loss of whatever, of course. you must be praying to this compassionate God who, who loves you and you love Him, and yet we don't see your condition changing at least immediately based on that prayer. Mm -hmm. And like the normal perhaps coincidence or, or course of life, some get cured, some Somewhere. die, some succumb to these things and suffer for a long time. And I think well, what Ayasab has presented really speaks to, to the essence of this. For a believer, he sees the world differently. And we have many examples of this. That this is part of the process, as he said, as Hazrat Prophet Islam has explained in this, this passage, so beautifully, this is part of the process, in fact, of refining our nature, becoming spiritual, and using this world as the laboratory, so to speak, to, to, to develop that. And examples are, are, are they abound in, in all faith traditions. We, we go back to the Old Old Testament, mm -hmm. where the, a, a prophet is mentioned that inspires us to be like him because he endured so much suffering. The prophet Job, Ayub, salam, we say, peace be upon him. Uh, what is he known for? The the, the patience of Job mm -hmm. is mentioned as one of the hallmarks of one's personality. You have the patience of Job. They're not saying you had a prayer uh, accepted overnight. They're saying this was a man who suffered so much that he began questioning his own faith, his own ability to, to, to withstand all this. Yet he went to the trials 
in which he was diseased himself. He was so diseased, his family abandoned him, his people didn't want to go near him, he couldn't minister them as a prophet. And through this long ordeal of going through this, his faith was perfected to excellence. And as I say, even now we recognize him as an outstanding character for because of that trial, because, because of, of that, that trial, tribulation. and because his prayer his wasn't answered right away. Uh, it reminds me again of uh, a narration that our fourth Khalifa, exalt his soul, is always mentioned in these kind of uh, you know questions. He spoke of this old man, this this, this saintly man. Mm -hmm who had a disciple who would be around him obviously trying to learn spiritual truths from this old man and, and the man would pray to God every day and as he's praying this the disciple the student could hear the response coming from God now this shows this man is spiritual but he kept hearing God saying your prayer is rejected and again the next day he'd say the prayer again he'd hear the word again that your prayer is rejected it's went on for years the old man is now getting older and the students sitting here thinking what am I learning from this old man? It's being so spiritual. Why is not God answering his prayer? Until finally one day he approached his master and he said, Oh, my, my beloved teacher, I, I've been watching you all these years. You've been praying to God who, who, who you say loves you and you say you love him, but your prayer is always rejected. And he said, I have a duty. My duty is to pray to God. Mm -hmm. It is the prerogative of God to accept it or reject it as he sees fit. And the moment he said this, he heard God's words and God said, all your prayers are accepted. Why were they all accepted? Because it was the spirit this man obviously carried in his mm -hmm. heart of trust that whatever God gives me is going to be best at that time and he'll give it to me when it's best, not when I want it, when I need it, when he knows this is the time, the moment for that prayer to be accepted. And that is exactly what we understand about this. And, and if our, our friend here would reflect, he would perhaps get a sense that this is why what appears to be a trial for believers is actually a blessing in disguise. Indeed. And one of the other attributes of God is all-knowing, which, all -knowing. Um, and because he is all-knowing, um, he knows when it is best. If we can continue with um, Muqsud Saab's uh, colleagues' questions, his next one, again, in part, we, I would suggest we've answered it, but he, it concerns that it's talking about God's design, God's plan. Often in the word, in Urdu, kismat is used, that, that person's destiny, fate was already there. So he says that God's plan is the way that believers in God traditionally explain things like amputations, cancer, hurricanes, car accidents. If a believer dies a painful and tragic death because of cancer, he dies as part of God's plan. His death has a purpose. God called him home for a reason. Even if something bad happens to a believer, it is actually good because it's part of God's plan. And the notion here is from uh, Maksud Saab's uh, colleague that, you know, it's, it's meaningless, this kind of statement. That is part of God's general pl plan. And when you sit down and you apply common sense, it shows a total lack of sense and then he actually says and it shows that God in itself as a concept is something of a person's imagination I mean this one again as I saw before we just ask you to start with this as well I mean we've answered it in part but this whole thing that you cannot control your destiny mm -hmm. um, and it's mm -hmm. pre you know decide what's going to happen when it's going to happen so mm -hmm. what's the point of anyone trying mm. yeah, the, the issue again is, is First, considering from the perspective of the being of God Almighty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we recognize that He is goodness par excellence. He is perfect in all that He does. He, he uses wisdom in all of His judgments. His relationship to us is one of mercy. He says, Rahmati wasiyat kul My mercy of all the attributes that you can describe this being called God. It's the mercy supersedes all other attributes and this is how he deals with his creation. It's a merciful, it's a compassionate, it's a loving relationship. And I can't emphasize the last word more. It's a loving relationship and even in a loving relationship in human affairs sometimes you endure things for the sake of love. Of course. And sometimes that shows in fact the quality of your love for the, for the being you are loving. Mm -hmm. It demands it. You just can't always be in 
a relationship where you're saying, if you love me, give me everything I want and give it to me right now. It's, it's part of the, perhaps the philosophy of, of even the youth culture of this, of this day and age where, you know, everything is fast food, it's fast cars, it's, everything is fast, we want it right now, we want to hit the big number, you know, we want the, the, the wealth overnight, be the, mm -hmm. the millionaire and all these things. And they say, look, believe us, you're not getting this. So your God is not loving you. In fact, what you're getting is all these trials and, and torments and, and tribulations and difficulties. So doesn't that show your God doesn't love you and is mm. not compassionate? When in fact, it's the exact opposite. Prophets of God have endured the most troubles and trials and tribulations that probably anyone that walks on earth. Mm -hmm. Once Hazrat Ahmed Aliyah and I promised I was asked this very question. That you say you're, you're God's prophet and you say you're God's beloved, but look at all the difficulties you're going through. You're getting opposition, you're getting mocked, you're getting ridiculed, you know, a storm of, of difficulties are raining upon you. And you say you're a man of God and God loves you. And he, when he heard the question, he smiled. Mm. He just says, do you sense troubles? <laughs> <laughs> in other words, he recognized that this is the pathway that leads him close, in fact, to his creator. As Allah says in Quran, and it was already quoted by Ayasaf, you are going to be trial in this world, tried in this world by the God that loves you to perfect your spiritual being, and that's a sign of his love for you. That's what you will go through to earn the highest reward and merit in his sight and be the best you can be. And the Prophet set that wonderful example for us, as again Ayasa mentioned earlier, and, and this question is uh, answered by that. Ayas, oh, if I could come to you in very practical terms, just to build on the answer there, is everything is life, is a, well, you could call it a trial or tribulation, but it's an exam. I mean, if I want to achieve something in education, you have to, you learn, you sit an exam, some may call it a trial, and I'm sure some of us have sat there thinking we haven't revised hard enough and it may become a tribulation because those three hours but it's a sense of achievement at the end that you have to sit an exam, pass that exam and the reward waits thereafter. Absolutely and Azhar Neef Sahib has very eloquently hinted to this in his discussion that the concept of this life and this world is such that it's basically God Almighty has put us at the starting line everybody's in a race we're at the starting line there's two paths this is one path which is the path of trials and tribulations which will lead to God and then there's that other path which is the trial which is the path of luxury and having fun all day and doing nothing but that path doesn't lead to God mm. and Allah doesn't compel anybody he says these are the two directions you pick which path you want to follow and we see that this is how it should have been mm. Because even in the worldly, uh, uh, even in our worldly affairs, we see that nobody can be deemed a successful man or a successful woman. Nobody can be deemed successful in any walk of their life until they go through trials and tribulations. I guarantee you, Atarik Saab, that if you speak to a businessman and you ask him, uh, you've created a huge company, mm -hmm. you're making millions and millions of dollars now, mm -hmm. or pounds in this case, we're in Britain. How did this happen? With pounds here, yes, that's How did it. that happen? And I guarantee you that his story would be that I started off in a state of destitution. I had nothing. I had to make ends meet. Mm. But I kept working at it. And then eventually I developed something for myself. This is the case with spirituality as well. That until we go through trials and tribulations, we are not worthy of reward. If there was no other side to the picture, if everything was a bed of roses, then why would we expect God Almighty to give us anything in the hereafter? And this is what defines a Muslim or a believer. He has this sense of purpose because he believes in a life hereafter. And he knows that whatever I do, as the promised Messiah Islam beautifully says, that our actions pose a reflection on the life hereafter. And we will see our untangible actions in a physical manner. In, a, in the hereafter, in the form of reward. So until we go through that, um, we cannot expect to gain anything. No pain, no gain. Mm. This is a very common uh, idiom which we use. Mm. So I think and that's really important to understand. You know, one thing he's saying is the people who live in this world assume the path of luxury and ease is the sign of success. Mm. Under that road is, you know, the, the, the golden arches, the pot of gold, and this is the paradise. Mm. When in fact, as you said, sometimes what we read in the Quran is Allah allows the disbelievers to enjoy this life as a trial of punishment for them. 
He gives him everything he wants. He says, your whole life is just for this world. I give it to you. But in the hereafter, you have no share. Mm -hmm. So we don't aspire to define our faith by getting the, the great and goodness the of this, this world. That is not the sign of a, a holy spiritual man. You may get it, of course. Nor should we be so shallow in our thinking that every difficulty and trial is God's plan. Mm -hmm. Is God's trial. Is, is come because God wants us to go through these things. Sometimes people make mistakes. Even good people make mistakes. Of course. And suffer the consequences of them. And, and so I agree with the questioner that sometimes we try to oversimplify everything happening in our life as this is God's will, this is, uh, I blame it on God. Sometimes you blame yourself for your mistakes too. And even as a believer, you suffer the consequences of, of your choices and your decisions and, and your behaviors. And, you know, God gives us faculties as human beings yes. and decision-making faculties, as you eloquently put it, two paths to follow, the path of one path or over the other. Um, and that maybe we can take um, the third question in this as well as yourself, because it sort of ties this all together, that if God was to exist, wouldn't you expect there to be a huge benefit to those who follow and obey him? Why instead do we see the opposite? Perhaps we've already touched on it, that mm. this kind of reward system shouldn't be seen in terms of material wealth mm. alone. But equally, people of faith can be highly successful, indeed wealthy as well. Mm. And it's a question of the faith, and you, you can get people on both sides. Um, equally, I would suggest that there's, I'm not quite sure where the question is coming from here, but the suggestion or the assumption here is that if you, that all people who have faith actually aren't rewarded. People of Muslim, the Muslim faith in the Muslim world, the majority of the Muslim world is in the so-called third world nations. They are in the poorest, the most tech technology backward, mm -hmm. education is of the lower standards, their societies don't have the facilities that you see in the, the Western non-Muslim nations or other parts of the world. And, and so the comparison will be drawn between this and that's why you have uprisings in some of these nations from the youth themselves saying that we are being deprived what we see other nations around this world are enjoying. And, and so someone in that comparison may, may assume this is an indication of the system of faith and belief that those people hold. Mm -hmm. And, and when in fact it may be an altogether different dynamic going on in all these nations. How they have de determined their course of events culturally, educationally, socially, politically, and not so much religiously based on the, the Sharia. So I would draw a distinction first and foremost between what God gives as reward for faith and what man earns as a reward of his effort different nations and groups are gaining for their effort, not so much for their faith, or losing because of their lack of effort. And the Muslims have been predicted by the Holy Prophet Muhammad that this is exactly what happened to them. He told them they would become wealthy and powerful, but that would be the source of their slow decline because they would lead them away from their values, their, their moral and spiritual principles. And it would result in this, that they would be in subjugation to other nations around them as almost a punishment to remind them to reflect and go back to their original values. This is why we believe in this day and age, Allah has raised a prophet of God, a messenger who was to come and reform the Muslims of this, this position, that uh, you've lost everything mm -hmm. and you're, you actually, you're pining for it, you desire it, but this is not the focus. Like Isa, Jesus Christ said to the Jews, the kingdom of God is not of this world. Gain that kingdom, you get the other kingdom as well. And the Holy Prophet Muhammad was once was leaving when he was migrating from Mecca to Medina along the way, along with Hazrat Abu Bakr, his companion, he was being pursued by a bounty hunter mm -hmm. who saw a chance to gain some, some wealth in this mm -hmm. bargain. When he came close to him, his horse kept falling down and he, couldn't, he was you know, perplexed, why is my horse falling every time I try to get near to him? He finally calls out to the messenger and says, oh messenger of God, I came to pursue you but I can't seem to reach you, what's going on? Calmly he turned back and he says, Oh, Saraka, how will it be when the bangles of the Khosros, this, this great powerful leader of the, you know, the Byzantine Iranian yeah. Empire, will be on your wrist? He was shocked. And he's a fugitive walking away with just one person, very weak, small group of followers at that point, and he's telling me, I'm going to be wearing the bangles of this powerful ruler? How will he overcome him? This is the answer to the question. What has been shown in history is the, the believers, in this case the Muslims, were of a very, very low, backward, 
you know, uncivilized and disrespected standard. But they rose up through faith and in, in following their traditions to the highest levels of the time, not through force. God gave them all these blessings by following and, and practicing the teachings of, of, of Islam. The realization there. Maksud Sab, Jazakumullah for your question, and I hope your colleague, when he hears the answers as well, if he's got any thoughts, questions, or observations, indeed, any of our viewers, you know what to do. The email, once again, it's faithmatters at mta.tv. We're going to go to Nigeria for our next question, and this comes from Abayomi Omosibi from Nigeria. Thank you for your question. And the question is as follows, is there a point to life before heaven, i.e. the life we're in now? If God wants what is best for everyone, it could, be, it could immediately place everyone in heaven. If we want what's best for our children, rather erroneously it suggests that, why do they need to live anyway? And surely God should send them straight to heaven because they're innocent. Um, that we don't need to do anything, that there is no God, or there is some purpose to life and evil. He goes on f to also ask, however, there is no such purpose. Babies who die, for example, in natural disasters go to heaven. Therefore, there is no essential point to life, he suggests, nor any essential reason that we have to endure suffering and go through the tests of life. We were talking about tribulations earlier before we can go to heaven. His assertion from all of the above is, therefore, no moral God exists. Yasab, if I could start with you on this, this whole idea that children, where we all agree, children indeed in the Muslim, the Islamic faith, we, we believe child is born innocent and that's why you know, it's not born with any sins. So the assertion here is, well, if the child is innocent, surely the best thing for the child is, before he or she actually lives, it's go straight to heaven. And parents should assist in that. It's very ironic, that Iqsab, that on one hand, when atheists raise this question, they say, well, if it's best for a child to go to heaven straight away, why bring him into this world in the first place? Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, they say, God is a very unjust God. He's a very selfish God. And then they present the verse of the Holy Quran, which states, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ that Allah says that I have not created the jinn and the men except that they may worship me. This shows that Allah is power hungry, God forbid, and He wants people to bow down before Him. But the purpose behind life is much deeper. Mm -hmm. The meaning of ibadat or worship is much deeper. Ibadat does not mean that a person sits in the corner somewhere and prays 24 hours a day. Asceticism is not encouraged in Islam. Mm -hmm. This is why the Holy Prophet wasallam said, La rahbaniyata fil Islam. There is no asceticism in Islam. If you wish to acquire the pleasure of God Almighty, if you wish to earn the love of God Almighty, then the best way to do that is to serve humanity, serve His creation. Mm -hmm. Whether that be human beings, animals, even vegetation. It's amazing. Sometimes I am awed at the graciousness and mercy of our beloved master the holy prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam it seems as if no living thing was outside his mercy this is why he used to instruct his companions that when you go out for a conquest or a war don't cut trees because these are living things people benefit from them animals benefit from them don't uselessly slaughter animals only take however much you need so yes philosophically as most atheist arguments are philosophically it seems like there's a lot of sense in killing a child right away and sending him straight to heaven because he's innocent but he would not be fulfilling the purpose that God Almighty brought him into existence for mm -hmm. God Almighty brought that child into existence so that he can grow old mm -hmm. and so that he can benefit the rest of the creation of God Almighty mm -hmm. and when you look at it from this perspective God Almighty is not a selfish God God Almighty is everything but selfish. Mm -hmm. He teaches that we should live a life and if we wish to attain the true purpose of ibadat or worship, we should serve mankind. So this is the process which God Almighty wish, wishes to put us through. And then when children grow old, when they learn from their parents that they should be good law-abiding citizens, they should help their fellow man, they should take care of animals, take care of plant life, take care of the universe as a whole. Mm -hmm. If they do that, then they receive reward.
mm. and then they are admitted into heaven and there's also another narration so as far as God is concerned he makes you earn what he gives you mm -hmm. and this is how it should be as far as babies are concerned there's a hadith of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he says that children are born on fitrah mm -hmm. on natural inclinations where they move towards God sure. and children who die in a young age without the opportunity to consciously realize which faith they wish to ascribe themselves to if such children die when they die their souls shall be presented to Hazrat Abraham salam. and Hazrat Abraham salam, who is referred to as the father of the prophets he will be responsible for conveying the message of God to those children and if they accept then they will be entered into paradise so even ch this is a false conclusion which I humbly would like to uh, tell my brother about that this is it's not fair to say that children are automatically admitted into heaven even then there is this element of deciding between right and wrong the beauty of mankind why is mankind referred to as Ashraful Makhluqat the most noble of creation of God mm -hmm. Almighty why are we the most noble because Allah the Almighty has given us a refined set of mental faculties and he has given us the ability to differentiate between right and wrong so he expects us to use that blessing which he has given us and when we use it correctly only then are we worthy of reward from God Almighty um, just at this point gentlemen we're just going to sort of break for our book uh, review and uh, this week's uh, book is actually Revelation, Rationality, Knowledge and Truth um, and c comments, thoughts, questions that you have arising from what you read. It's, a, it's a quite a hefty read as you can see. Um, faithmatters at mta.tv is the email. Do let us know your thoughts and questions that you have from that. Assalamu alaikum. Revelation, Rationality, Knowledge and Truth by Hazrat Mirza Tahi Ahmed, Halifa Tul Masih the Fourth. May Allah be pleased with him. Any divide between revelation and rationality, religion and logic, has to be irrational. If religion and rationality cannot proceed hand in hand, there has to be something deeply wrong with either of the two. Does revelation play any vital role in human affairs? Is not rationality sufficient to guide man in all the problems which confront him? Numerous questions such as these are examined with minute attention. All major issues which intrigue the modern mind are attempted to be incorporated in this fascinatingly comprehensive statute. Whatever the intellectual or educational background of the reader, this book is bound to offer him something of his interest. It examines a very diverse and wide range of subjects including the concept of revelation in different religions, history of philosophy, cosmology, extraterrestrial life, the future of life on earth, natural selection and its role in evolution. It also elaborately discusses the advent of the Messiah or other universal reformers awaited by different religions. Likewise, many other topical issues which have been agitating the human mind since time immemorial are also incorporated. The main emphasis is on the ability of the Quran to correctly discuss all important events of the past, present and future from the beginning of the universe to its ultimate end. Aided by strong incontrovertible logic and scientific evidence, the Quran does not shy away from presenting itself to the merciless scrutiny of rationality. It will be hard to find a reader whose queries are not satisfactorily answered. Welcome back from uh, the uh, book review. We'll, we were carrying on and we were talking about before we went to the break about the existence of God and today's program is focused just on that and we've had a couple or two or three 
questions and uh, various series of questions covering off the existence of God um, and indeed the purpose of life as well. And we're going to sort of continue with that theme now and for this we're going to travel to Toronto for our next question which comes from uh, Rafi Ahmed Sahib. Um, Jazakumullah for your question Rafi Sahib. Um, first of all he extends a very warm assalamu alaikum to the panel and also some very kind comments Rafi Sahib Jazakumullah for the program to all concerned with the program that's very kind of you and he's also asking a question on behalf of a non-Muslim friend of his and it's this it is argued that people need to believe in God because without God people will do bad things just because something is perceived as having a good consequence if it is true such as a belief in God does not actually make it true the fact that religiously free societies with a proportionately large number of atheists are generally more peaceful than otherwise is evident this perception is incorrect however this does not mean atheists are implicit, implicitly peaceful Azhar Sahib, the whole concept of religion, peace, atheism, belief this is a sort of quite a varied question but um, if I come to you first of all on this religion does it have a purpose and it seems to suggest that those people without religion actually lead more peaceful lives I wish the experiments and and social uh, social experiments prove this to be true but I I see something differently even in the modern times uh, there have been experiments with promoting an atheistic order of life amongst the people. Most recently you can say the USSR, Russia. They were definitely in, in the communist system a atheistic people. They completely removed God from the equation. Because religion, you just weren't allowed to mention religion. religion the whole idea, it's, it's the opiate for the masses, you know, mm. it's just some way to again take people's minds away from the real you know, uh, focus and purpose of life which is to, to, to use your faculties and, 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 and to share and work together toward the betterment of society and, and that's it you know, you know it's this world is the end and be all of life however we see that the very system in 1989 was pulled down by the people themselves because the order was not peaceful it wasn't balanced it didn't provide all of the mechanisms so that everyone can live to their fullest potentials they were being suppressed and, and they were being controlled they were finding that uh, there was constrictions and so many things some people who wanted to be religious even to express themselves were, were being uh, again stifled and suppressed so that experiment itself is an indication that the so-called philosophy of an atheistic order doesn't produce anything greater or nobler or more productive as a, as a, as a group than what religions have been producing over the course of human history mm -hmm. in comparison to societies in their original states under the guidance of prophets and unless let me emphasize it again in the original condition under the under the guidance of prophets over the course of time yes you can look at the history of almost any group including groups of religious people and you can you can see things that are you know sources of criticism they are not peaceful they're getting involved in, in all types of behaviors which are not moral which are not just which are not conducive to creating harmony in society but that's after centuries sometimes have passed from the original order that's been somewhat changed so I would go back and argue that no matter what we we consider the best orders have always been established by the prophets of God and the principles they were taught through divine revelation and these also are the best examples for us to aspire in terms of creating a harmonious peaceful society and Prophet of Islam produced that society in Medina which is part you know bar none is one of the best societies that have ever been created in terms of a peaceful just loving order between Muslims and non-Muslims who in fact in Medina were in the majority yet they were all living together hand by hand in Spain when the Muslims again rose to ascendancy the Jewish community up to now will say that was their period their, their golden era in Spain how could that be when again Muslims were ruling at that time there was no anti-semitism there was no routing out the Jews from society and sending them across the ocean as was done here in England when they when the, you know the the Inquisition was coming down hard that didn't happen in Spain so we see the examples of morality and spirituality 
weighing in heavily in the balance when society is based on theism as opposed to atheism. Just building on that concept, you r rightly pointed about Russia, the USSR rather than Russia, and again you talked about Islamic rule in Spain. But what about the here and now? Surely religion is a cause of wars, and so religion causes conflict. It causes conflict not just between one religion and another, so the assertion of this question is, but between religions itself. Go back not so long ago to Muslim nations, Iran and Iraq, before uh, the invasion of Iraq. Prior to that, it was a, a fight between two neighbors, two countries, both Muslim. Mm. And many would actually say it's religion which is the cause of those wars. Well, it's not so much religion. It, it appears on the surface that religious differences are the motivating factors. But as you, as you point out, there are so many other factors that come into the equation here. Politics begins to, to, to dominate because man wants to control larger and larger territory of earth and claim it as, as their own. The same also is economics. This is an economic situation to pull in the resources into a kingdom and, and to control uh, a people what going on right now. These elements have nothing to do with religion because in all these cases where it seems it's a religious war, in the final analysis you actually come to recognize it was something different. That's why they never say World War I or World War II fought in Europe uh, you know, amongst Christian nations was never a religious war. It was a, a, a war based on politics, economics, and, and etc. But they'll always say that whenever two Muslim nations are fighting, this is religion. So I think there's a little slight bias here. There's a, uh, there is, there's a slice, and uh, Yasov, is it not true often religion is the cause of blame? But, and indeed it's imp implicit perhaps in the question, if not explicit, but certainly is being implied that you know, atheist societies may be more peaceful indeed, as Yasov's already dealt with that one, but that religion is the cause of that. But surely it's not so much religion, it's how it's being perhaps misinterpreted or misunderstood. Absolutely. <coughs> Islam presents a very fundamental principle. Islam says that no thing in itself is evil or good. The misuse or proper use of that thing makes it good or evil. And similarly, when we bring um, religion into the picture, I have to very uh, sadly say that the media is greatly responsible for projecting religion as the cause for violence. This is not fair, and it's not true either. The fact of the matter is that the pure and sacred and the holy name of religion, the good name of religion is used, misused should I say, by people who wish to acquire their political ends, their economic goals and other worldly purposes. So we should put things into perspective when we analyze religion. And another problem, whenever I discuss this issue with atheists, is that they'll always present the example of uh, nations, Muslim nations who committed injustices no doubt there has been a dark era in Islamic history but the problem is that when we analyze religion we tend to analyze historically speaking the wrong period in time mm -hmm. if you wish to acquire a true insight into the historic results and outcomes of religious teachings then analyze the period of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam analyze the period of his four Khulafa the rightly guided caliphate and see how Islam established a beautiful harmonious society for everybody. Another thing which is really important to realize is that this question is raised that perhaps atheists um, are also good people so why do we need religion in the first place because religion is responsible for all of these wars. I've mentioned that this is not the case but also another thing is that without the concept of God and without the concept of religion man-made legislation is not sufficient to guide a person to the heights of spirituality because the problem with man-made legislation is that it does not reach the dark abyss where evil inclinations culminate and that is the heart but God reaches there there's this beautiful example of a father who had five sons he gave them each a chicken and he said take this somewhere and slaughter it where nobody will see you four of his children did so they hid somewhere they slaughtered the chicken brought it back to their father the fifth one happened to be a very smart, intelligent young boy. He came back to his father with the chicken unslaughtered. And he said, oh father, I couldn't find anywhere to slaughter this chicken because wherever I was, there was God. And this is the beauty of religion, that it teaches you that even when your 
in private when there's nobody to see you nobody to watch you there is this ever watchful eye of God Almighty and this is what helps us increase in our spirituality to such a level that you will be good as a natural impulse without the desire for reward and this is what Islam teaches and religion in essence teaches and that's where we div make a dividing line between religious men and women or atheistic men and women that atheists or people who don't have this sense of a creator they will never be able to develop complete selflessness they will always have this desire to return to receive something in return for a good deed but God teaches you that if you're a true believer you should reach such a level of giving as a mother gives to her child without any desire for reward whatsoever so when we reach that spiritual status only then can we refer to ourselves as truly religious men and women and this is the beauty of religion Zakumullah, and indeed I think it would be fair to say, gentlemen, and for Rafi Yam Saab's friend as well, um, religion, you, you have people who are good in religion, and indeed you have atheists who are good in religion, but religion defines a code by which you can increase your spiritual development as well. Um, it's often said, isn't it, we live by our own rules, but religion also provides these noble, virtuous rules as well. We're going to... Um, come back to home shores now to the UK in Hartlepool Shafia Said sent in um, a few questions um, she's has asked for these questions to ask it's a friend of hers who doesn't have um, a direct uh, link to uh, uh, MTA but inshallah Shafia we will get your uh, questions and the answers rather sent over to you as well so be rest assured on that but thank you for your questions her first question, simple one, why do we assume that God is good? Azar Saab. It's, it's not an assumption. It's a perception to experience and what we're being taught about the nature of God. And the very world all around us, in fact, is showing us the goodness and the greatness of this, our creator. Uh, you know, there's this old uh, saying about in an Arab who passes through the desert and someone asks him the question how do you prove that God exists and he says that when I walk through the desert and I see in the desert the, the fecal matter of the, of the camel the droppings of the camel I know a camel has passed through this way and when I see the footsteps of a man that I know a man has passed through this way how can it be when I look around this grand universe and see its order and its beauty and its design and, and every part of it is, is interdependent but supports every other aspect of life it cannot have a creator who is good, who is wise who is prominent in every particle of life this is the, this is the uh, perception of a true believer looking at the world we live in and who doesn't think this world is good how we came into this world through the passage of a womb after nine months of being in that, that very small uh, cavity, so to speak, being fed through the, the, the blood channel of a mother, and then suddenly emerge into life when in that very second of, of uh, our first breath is so critical. If everything doesn't go in order, we would have perished. Mm -hmm. As soon as we're born, look at the goodness of God again, that we'd have to express ourselves for the rest of our life and still couldn't count Indeed. the favors and blessings of, of God. He says, if you try to count my, my blessings, you can never enumerate them. And he's given us the milk, he's given us the air, he's given us the light, he's given us the companions, he's given us all these things throughout our life. And we, we just reflect on that alone. We understand that God is good. Come what may in our lives in terms of trials as we talked about already and, and the, you know, the difficulties of ups and downs. But the very goodness of this creator, this sustainer, this provider, this one who nurtures and, 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 and develops us to the, to the higher and higher stages. When we were nothing, absolutely. He, said, he says in the Quran, billahi wa kuntum amwatin. How can you disbelieve in God when you were nothing? You didn't exist. And now you come into the world and lo, you're disputing about my existence, <laughs> that I'm, I'm not nothing and, and you're everything. It's amazing how it is. Uh, there's a verse in the Quran I, I, I would love to share uh, re regarding this. Uh, and it, it speaks on all these bounties. And in the end, it, it asks man to reflect on what condition he is in. It's, this is in uh, the chapter of Abraham, Ibrahim. 
of chapter 14, verse number 33 to 35. Again, if you don't enumerate Bismillah, that would be 32 to 34. It says, Allah is he who created the heavens and the earth and caused water to come down from the clouds and brought forth therewith fruits for your sustenance. And he has subjected to you the ships that you may sail through the sea by his command. And the rivers too has he subjected to you. And he has also subjected to you the sun and the moon, both performing their work constantly. Imagine if they stopped for a second. Mm -hmm. The sun would just stop revolving for a second and giving the heat what kind of world we would live in. All these blessings. And he says, and he has subjected to you the night as well as the day. And he gave you all that you wanted of him. And if you try to count the favors of Allah, you will not be able to number them. Verily, man is very unjust, very ungrateful. This is the, 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 the subject matter being described in all the bounties and blessings we receive from this, this beneficent God. And in the end, he says, you know, the, the sad part of it, all this equation is, this whole scenario is, you still don't recognize the goodness of my being toward you. Even when you could not ask for it, I provided everything. And that's an important point. I, I think the implication of some of the questions uh, have been, uh, Yasab, you know, that just because God only cares about those of faith. Indeed, if someone is an atheist, it is a person of faith, a Muslim's belief as well. God looks after everyone. God's the creator of everything. It's not discarding those who do not believe in him. But just uh, sort of continuing with Shafia's question, the next one, we've talked about good comes the next question which is the obvious one about evil she asks who made the devil and why a very uh, valid question as far as this question is concerned why God created the devil the answer to that is I'll give an example we have a teacher a teacher spends four months of a term and teaches a student a certain coursework and after that coursework is complete and he has taught that student everything that he needed to teach and gave him the lectures that he needed does he not take an exam? of course he does would anybody call that teacher unjust for taking an exam from that child? okay well, <laughs> <laughs> well I've taught you everything yes. now I want to know what you remember Indeed. how much did you benefit from all of those lectures that I gave you from all of those teachings which I provided to you so too is the case with Allah the Almighty Allah states in the Holy Quran فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا that God Almighty has told us the path of evil and He has told us the path of goodness I go back to that same statement we're all in a race mm -hmm. There's, we're at the starting line and Allah has told us that this is the path that leads to Satan and this is my displeasure and this is the path which leads to me you decide which one you want to take this is why God Almighty has created two opposite forces to create balance we have a force of evil which invites to evil and says come here come here do this this is this is good for you this is a life of luxury enjoy yourself until you're here mm -hmm. nothing to worry about there's no life after death mm -hmm. and then on the other side you have the angelic forces pushing you and pulling you towards God Almighty no you must pray to God Almighty you must develop yourselves mentally and physically and spiritually you must bow to that creator who brought you into existence as Azhar Sahib has mentioned so eloquently and when a person makes his decision based on that he receives his reward or punishment and this is absolute justice this is not injustice on the part of God Almighty if there was no evil force and there was only good all over the place then a man would not be worthy of reward because he would not have the ability to commit a wrong deed but the beauty the example of taqwa is so beautiful that a spiritual saint a Sufi saint has mentioned that taqwa is like having a piece of cloth a mantle but taqwa just for the taqwa righteousness 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 the concept of righteousness can be explained as such a man has a mantle on top of him and he has to walk through a thorny set of bushes and he must save his mantle from getting stuck into those thorny bushes and if he passes through that on the other side is God this is the case with the devil this is the case with the world and this is the case this is why the holy the promised Messiah والسلام, has called this place Darul Imtihan it is a place where an examination is taking place 
and those people who follow the objectives and injunctions of God Almighty shall receive their reward those people who choose to take the path of Satan they themselves are responsible the Holy Quran says something very beautiful with regards to Satan Allah the Almighty addresses Satan in a figure of speech and says inna ibadi laysa laka alayhim sultan that verily O Satan you have no jurisdiction over my rightful servants illa man ittaba'aka min al ghawin except for those people who themselves choose to take a path of misguidance they will follow you so we ourselves are responsible for our actions and we ourselves are responsible for the outcome of our actions so we've talked about um, for that uh, the good and the evil um, in the last sort of five minutes of the program if we just sort of take one more question and it sort of goes on the same concept uh, again Shafia's friend is asking the question if God is all powerful why does he permit people to suffer and children to starve to death either he cannot or he will if he cannot he then it, the assertion is he's not powerful if he will not then he is evil for both of these reasons they think God has uh, they, they think God has not been able to be worshipped I, I think the whole concept here is that why does God actually allow this to happen and why does he stop it and if he doesn't stop it surely it's within his realm to stop such things it's, it's, a, it's an interesting scenario presented as to why why you know the question is always asked why it's the eternal question a why? after <laughs> some yes. difficulty or catastrophe has been faced I'm sure right now the people in the world in certain parts in, in Japan and in, in Australia and other where they've suffered so many you know natural catastrophes they've been asking the question why and people look at them and say why what did they do to deserve this at the same time no one asked the question why when they're receiving all these benefits of their creator up to that point how come they fail to recognize the life they were living of luxury and ease the life that was so good to them and no one screams out why why God why are you so good to me why are you so kind to me why you give me all these things why I deserved all this no the, the question why never comes into play until that moment which is really in the span of, of lives individually or collectively it's really quite small we're never suffering our entire lives there's no eternal night in terms of suffering there's always a dawn, there's always a, the rise of sun again. This is the alteration of, of destinies individually and collectively of nations. And God speaks about that in that he causes these, these days, the, the ayam Allah, he calls them, the days of Allah, they keep changing. Sometimes you go to adversity, sometimes you go to prosperity. It's only to see, as he said, that which of you will be grateful for my favors and during times of gratitude, as the prophet said, this is the time to pray this is the time to reflect and to pull God into your life and to make him your shield in moments of difficulty it's 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 shocking that people don't recognize that the believers even in these difficulties often are spared this measure of, of a disaster or, or troubles as others and people think otherwise you've already had the question why do you believers have a different but in fact we find that in the history of mankind, the history of religions, it's the believers who are spared from these things and saved sometimes remarkably as the Prophet Messiah, the founder of this Jamaat said that one thing God has revealed to me Inni al fiddar, I will protect and save everyone who's in your house it didn't just mean the four walls of his house it meant this is like the Noah's Ark this was, this was like the people walking with Moses to get through the river while Pharaoh was drowned this was like the people with Prophet Muhammad وسلم, who went into battle with, with just some, 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 some sticks and some, you know, some, some stones against armies who had swords and spears and they came out victorious and all of the other difficulties famines and pestilences whatever happened earthquakes it's the believers who are, who are saved and who are singled out for another blessing of Allah as opposed to those who don't have belief and the blessings are such that um, the program has flown by and we've reached the end of the program I would say to uh, Shafia and indeed to Tanvir Sahib from Birmingham we have received your questions inshallah we will be covering those off on another program and to our other viewers thank you for watching um, you know what to do if you want to send in your question it's faithmatters at mta.tv faithmatters at mta.tv is the email 
844 for the UK, 208 687 8037. It's for those wanting to use the facts. Azar Sahib, Ayaz Sahib, thank you once more for your questions. And I just leave you with a parting thought on faith matters once again. Does God exist? The famous story of footprints in the sand, a person reflecting on life with God saying, you promised me, Lord, that if I followed you in life, you would walk with me always. But I've noticed that during the most testing of times of my life, there is only one set of footprints in the sand. God answered, it was at those most testing and tribulant times that I carried you. Until the next time, from all of us on Faith Matters, Assalamu Alaikum.